Hi, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the fifth webinar in Cystic Fibrosis Canada's virtual education series for patients and caregivers. The webinar today will be recorded for those who are unable to attend and will be available through our website for later viewing. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Please use the raise your hand feature to be unmuted so that you can ask your question verbally, or alternatively, you can type your question in the Q&A box that's located on the panel to the, on the right-hand side of your screen. We are very excited to have with us today Dr. Patrick Daniel to di discuss CF treatment adherence. Dr. Daniel is a pediatric respirologist in Quebec, where he is head of the Pediatric Respirology Unit and director of the Pediatric CF Clinic at Centre Mère-Enfant Soleil du Chou de Québec. In addition to his clinical roles, Dr. Daniel is professor at Université Laval and is active in clinical research with a special interest in CF newborn screening. He is also a current member of CF Canada's Healthcare Advisory Council. We are also fortunate to have Matthew with us today. Matthew is a young adult with cystic fibrosis who has kindly made himself available to answer questions on treatment adherence from a patient's perspective during the Q&A period of the webinar following Dr. Daniel's talk. I'll now pass the presentation over to Dr. Daniel to start us off. Hello. I'll, uh, I'll figure this out, right? Okay. So yes, my name is Patrick Daigneault. Uh, you were pretty close on that for the, pre for the pronunciation of my name. <laughs> I'm a pediatric respirologist in, uh, at the Centre Mère Enfant Soleil du Chute Québec in Quebec City, in beautiful Quebec City. However, our weather has been very variable in the last few weeks, uh, alternating between hot, sweltering days and uh, r a completely rainy and showery days. So we'll start without further ado, uh, this presentation on treatment adherence. I gave this presentation in French um, last May, I believe, April or May, at the CF Canada presentation in Montreal. Uh, this is the first time I'll give it in English, so I had to translate all my slides, but I think it, the English should be pretty good. Uh, so I'm happy to be with you today for you all in the afternoon here in the Easter, in the Easter board and uh, out west in the late morning. So I'll just try to switch slides. I don't have control on the slides right now, so you need to give me control on the slides, which I had a little earlier. So right now I see my presentation at least. This is the first time I see it. Okay. Okay. I think it should go. It should go. I think it uh, my it didn't it didn't like that I had uh, put it on uh, on uh, full uh, full mode. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. There we go. Take it away. Okay. So, uh, hello again. <laughs> so, my presentation is uh, called Understanding and Improving Therapeutic Adherence in Cystic Fibrosis, a Pathway to Success. Um, the plan for this presentation is as such. Um, I'll try to discuss where are we now and where we're going about CF treatments, present and future, very briefly, of course. We'll talk about the therapeutic burden of, for patients and their daily, daily life. We'll talk about the differences between compliance, observance, adherence, and adhesion. They seem to be all the same, but I'll make you a few distinctions between them. We'll talk about the importance of therapeutic adherence, why is good adherence so difficult to attain, how we can measure adherence when we do studies. We'll give you some data on adherence in CF, what is expected. And I'll talk to you about our study in a pediatric CF center in Quebec City and what it, uh, what it can teach us. And we'll finish off by trying to figure out how can we explain poor adherence in chronic diseases and what we can do to improve it. Improve it. So a few definitions first. Compliance to treatment, that was what was ta uh, taught uh, when I went in med school. We said this is compliance to treatment. It's, it corresponds to the conformity to a prescription without taking into account the degree of agreement of the patient. So the patient basically takes his medication, doesn't like it, but still does it, so that's compliance. Observance to a treatment adds a behavioral dim dimension to adherence. It includes the treatment, but also other rules such as no smoking and stuff like that, but it doesn't really involve the agreement of the patient. He just follows the rules. 
Then adherence. That's what was taught more recently in med schools. Uh, adherence evokes a link of elements of equal value. So patient thinks about it, says, okay, I'm pretty much convinced I need to treat myself, so I'll try to be adherent. That's adherence. And then there's finally adhesion to, to treatment. Adhesion implies more intrinsic processes, such as motivation to, to do a treatment or attitudes of the patients to follow a treatment plan. It's very difficult to measure adhesion, really, because it's a degree of acceptance of a patient towards his or her plan of treatment. It symbolizes the, the, what's called therapeutic alliance. So we're trying to do an alliance. We're, we say, okay, what should we do for a treatment? We try to make a plan together, and if all goes well, then we have a good adhesion to treatment. So basically, the title of my presentation shouldn't be therapeutic adherence, but should mostly be therapeutic adhesion in cystic fibrosis, which would be the best. However, because adhesion is very difficult to measure and to determine, well, we often just stick to adherence. So how about the importance of therapeutic adhesion? Well, as you know, median survival in CFS is still increasing year after year. I'll give you a, a graph next, uh, on the next slide about this. However, CF is still a progressive disease that can lead to an increase in the burden of treatment with age, as you all know. Uh, the treatment tends to increase and it doesn't improve with time. And this can often go against a certain quality of life. Uh, we all know that a prescribed treatment doesn't mean that it is done or even that it is done well. So uh, you don't, even doctors know about that. We know that we're prescribing something and we can't expect all the treatments to be done, but we hope that most of them will be done, especially in sicker patients. So median survival in CF has been increasing over the last 30 years. We have here the CF Canada Annual Report from 2013 the median survival age was between 20 and 25 by the, the, the back then, and it's now over 50 years of age on average, uh, median survival uh, in, in Canada. So it has greatly improved. There's no, I don't know any diseases who have seen an increase in survival such as this one. Over the last, what, 40 years, there's been an increase in survival of 25 years. So that's phenomenal especially for a chronic disease. But we do ask a lot from our patients. Uh, if you see CF such as like this, this is a graph that we often see in, in CF conferences. So you have an abnormal CFTR gene, that's the basic problem, the mutations on the CFTR gene that leads to a deficient protein leading to thick respiratory secretions, bronchial obstruction in the lungs, chronic infections of the lungs, inflammation, and then scarring or bronchiectasis and deterioration of the pulmonary function test. So that's the respiratory part of CF. But there are treatments that try to target all these parts. Here, the deficient protein can be corrected, hopefully, with potentiators and correctors, such as uh, uh, Kaleidico, which is the first one on the market, uh, to try to improve uh, the, the, the deficient CFTR protein to prevent thick respiratory secretions. If you do have thick respiratory secretions, you can use our DNAs, such as pulmoslime, hypertonic saline, mannitol, physiotherapy, to try to uh, not lead to bronchial obstruction. If you do have infection or to prevent infection, you can use inhaled antibiotics or oral antibiotics to prevent here chronic infection. And if you have inflammation, you can use an anti-inflammatories such as azithromycin to um, make sure that you don't go up to bronchiectasis. So, but that's a lot of treatments. But there's also enzymes, vitamins, nutrition, exercise, etc. So there's we do ask a lot for, from our patients in that perspective. So how can we choose from all of this? How can we adopt? a more acceptable daily routine in our CF patients. Because there are multiple other treatments that are under investigation on the long run. There are other correctors and potentiators such as uh, Kaleidico, but there are others out there. They, on the long run, that might reduce the burden of care on the long run, but we're not, still not sure where this will be going. There has been newer inhaled antibiotics that have been studied that can be used. 
And there are many other uh, such uh, medications that are under, uh, under investigation. And the order in which all of these should be prescribed is not with well set. It's not set in stone. It's various, varies uh, between patients. It varies between clinics. It varies between clinicians. So there's a lot to be said about the different treatments. In many clinics, uh, for instance, DNA spomazyme can be started at, on each patient at six years of age. But most clinics use it when needed afterwards when there are, when there are um, symptoms that are present. So there's a lot of variations and there's no clear cut uh, pathway to treatments. There is, however, a tendency towards a more aggressive management of the disease over the last decades, but with good results, as you've seen. The survival has increased a lot. There is a greater emphasis on the duration of life, but, can, but this can uh, diminish the quality of life. But there have been recent efforts in the last well, five to 10 years that are made to take under consideration the daily quality of life and to try to diminish the duration of some treatments. For instance, the different uh, nebulizations, while well, the nebulizers have, imp have improved, the duration of nebulizations have shortened. Some antibiotics can be given by powder instead of by nebulization. So there are hope on, uh, on reducing the burden of treatment. For a newborn with CF in 2015, we set high objectives, high, we have high aims for them. We try to aim for a normal growth curve for their genetic target. We try to ensure early treatment of pseudomonas and then remain aggressive against respiratory exacerbations to reduce uh, their uh, scarring on the lungs on, over the long run. We try to look for possible complications to hopefully avoid them and treat them early. We aim for a normal lung function as much as humanly possible going into adulthood. And we aim for an adult life that should be as normal as possible, including schooling, work, family life, while juggling a reasonable treatment burden. So there is a lot to be given for a newborn with CF right now. We should, this is what we try to aim, and this is what we, we say to, pay, to parents of a newborn. Uh, we're trying to aim for a normal growth curve and a normal respiratory function and normal daily life as much as possible. But in preschoolers, daily life can, be, can still be a burden. There are a high number of medical visits, at least in the first two years of life, to, incre uh, to ensure proper growth. There's a higher likelihood of ER visits and hospitalizations in younger children. There's often a high number of oral antibiotic courses because we try to make sure that they don't get infected, so we treat them early. There's numerous vaccinations already on the normal vaccination routine, but we also add some vaccinations in CF, including palivizumab antibody, antibodies, at least in the first year of life and sometimes in the first two years of life. Uh, there's sometimes needs for nutritional supplements and at least uh, um, care for no good nutrition. We try to begin physiotherapy, and that cannot be easy in, uh, in preschoolers and two-year-olds and three-year-olds, so that's not easy. We have to add pancreatic enzymes and vitamins in most patients, in about 85% of patients. Uh, daycare and family support, of course, is more difficult in patients with CF because not all daycare, daycare centers are equipped to face with, for a patient with uh, a chronic disease or that needs uh, treatments such as vitamins and pancreatic enzymes and things like that. And we have to take certain environmental protect precautions such as not going into uh, uh, jacuzzis or things like that. For school-age children, well, there's higher likelihood of missed days in school. There are clinic visits, exam, possible hospitalizations. Physiotherapy is generally about an hour a day if they're, if they're done properly. Nebulized antibiotics can be as much as an, one hour a day for patients colonized with pseudomonas or, or if they need uh, uh, pulmazyme or hypertonic saline. Uh, nutritional supplements, enzymes, and vitamins are needed. And other treatments can be added depending on complications, such as uh, slow gr growth or things like that. Towards adolescence, well, there is restriction of some activities associated with adolescence. Uh, pat these patients, the adolescents, need to juggle between sleep, schooling, friends, part-time work, treatments, 
and the order of these is not necessarily the same as I've written on this. On this, so treatments, yes, should be earlier than that. But does it go before friends, before part-time work? Where does it go? Gearing through adulthood, well, some patients will want to go to higher studies, to go to university. There's the question between part-time work versus full-time work, uh, work versus the treatment burden, missed days of school or missed days at work that can be difficult for patients with TF, love life, family life, having children of their own, so there's a lot going on, even for adults without any uh, chronic diseases. So for patients who have the chronic diseases or uh, needs uh, follow-up, close follow-up, needs some daily treatments, it's very, very much more difficult. There's physiotherapy, nebulized treatments, some, for some patients insula, insulin injections, nutrition and insulin enzymes. For certain patients, there's tube feeding, uh, hospitalizations in some, or home IV antibiotics. Some patients may need home oxygen or BPAP, and some may go to transplant and post-transplant sites. So there's a lot going on for adult CF patients. So we do expect a lot. So why is adhesion so difficult? Well, you've got it from what I've given you in the last few slides. But there are studies that have tried to uh, evaluate what factors are involved in adhesion to treatments. There are individual factors from the patient himself. There's his age, so younger patients, older patients, adult patients. I'll, I'll give you a few hints about that in the next few slides. Gender, maybe uh, women versus men. Do some are more adherent or not? Well, some, we, we tend to think that maybe uh, female patients are more adherent than males, but that's not necessarily true from the studies. Uh, general medical knowledge may improve or deteriorate adhesion. Knowledge of disease or knowledge of the treatments might improve adherence. Comprehension, behavior, mental health can all, uh, uh, can all uh, be um, involved. Coping methods in their disease, their faith, their perceptions about the disease. So all of these are factors that might be involved in adhesion in an individual patient. There's also the family, the family structure. Do they live with both parents? Do you have a uh, do, it, do they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Uh, the, their health insurance or other monetary aspects can be much more important in some patients. Their no, the knowledge of the disease by the family is important because if a lot of people know about the disease and can help the patient go through harder times, it's uh, helpful. Comprehension, behavior, and mental health also in the family is important. Coping methods, faith and perceptions, the same as in the individual can um, be implicated. And this can be important if their perceptions are different between the family and the individual. The quality of family relations can be very much, very important in this. And the implications in care. I forgot to translate this one. There, there's health care uh, involved. And the, the health care in, in, in particular has some factors involved in adhesion. The access to care, if you call and can have a, an easy access to a clinic visit, if you can call and have a, 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 a fast phone call with the nurse to help you out. The continuity of care, the going to the same place every single time. <clears throat> the communication with the healthcare team, the decision sharing, do, do you, are you imposed some treatment and this is what you're going or is this being discussed with the, uh, between the, the, the healthcare team and the patient? The number of visits, the attitudes and the perceptions of the healthcare team towards the disease but also towards the individual and the family. These are all other factors that can be important in adhesion and virulence. And also the community, the neighborhood, the work uh, force, the school, the support of peers, the stigmatization of the disease, real or perceived, these are all also other factors that are involved in the adhesion. So all of these are involved and might be important. It's very difficult to know which factors are more important for a certain family or a certain patient. And it's uh, partly our job in, at the healthcare team to try to figure out which factor should be more important for a patient uh, compared to another one. So how can we measure adhesion? If you say, okay, we, we think that adhesion or adherence to treatments might be a problem in our clinic. Is there a way to measure that? 
can we say, okay, I think this patient doesn't take his, his medication, or I think this patient probably takes everything. It's very difficult to know exactly uh, how, how many treatments the patient is doing. Uh, of course, adhesion to treatment is difficult to measure, so we measure mostly adherence because the adhesion of the patient to what we're giving them, it's mostly in their head, so we're, we're not sure about that. So uh, we try to balance, uh, when we try to measure uh, adherence, we try to balance between what's easily done, like some questionnaires that can be doubtful, we're not sure exactly, and some objective measures but can, that can be compl complicated. There are numerous methods, like I've named, I've uh, numbered you at least five here to measure adherence. You can do questionnaires to the patient, to the family, or to the medical team and try to say, okay, what do you really do in your treatment? These questionnaires always tend to overestimate what patients do really. Even if they say, we'll check afterwards, the patient tends to say, oh yeah, I do 90% of my treatments or 100%, but then if you check, it's 75% or 70 even though we're telling them that we're going to check afterwards. So p patients tend to overestimate what they're really doing. And it's not because they're lying, it's because they think they're doing most of the things. Uh, the therapeutic response can be uh, also measured. Of course, there are other factors that are implicated, but we're saying, oh, if the patient is doing well, he's probably doing his, all his treatment. But that's not true, of course. Patients can be just lucky and not do anything, but still be pretty healthy. And some are doing everything they can, but they're still not doing as well as we'd hoped for. The third method to measure adhesion is the number of acquired medication. That's a good way to measure it. At least we can know what the patients bought at the pharmacy. Of course, we're not sure if everything is bought is always taken or well taken, but at least we know that if they bought it, at least they intended to take it and they're probably not throwing it away because it costs a lot of money. So we hope that this can be a good way, even though it's not perfect. For certain medication, we can do blood or urine measures of the medication. It's invasive, it's not easy. It's not always reliable also, and it's not possible for most drugs. And of course, it represents only what's been taken in the last day or the last few days, so you can't always be sure. But it can be helpful in some things. We do measure uh, uh, the, some uh, medications such as antifungal treatments, treatments against, uh, against fungi. Uh, we can measure it because we want to know if the patient is taking the proper dose, but sometimes we, we realize that the patient is at zero. So it's probably not taking anything, uh, but at least we can measure that. But uh, that, even though that's not the, 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 what we were looking for at first. And the fifth way to measure uh, treat, adhesion treatment to treatment is the electronic monitoring. For some treatments, that can be done. Uh, you can add to nebulizers, you can add some uh, uh, measures to say, okay, how long has it been used? Has it been used? Um, but it's not usually done because it costs a lot of money. You can't add just like that, uh, uh, things like that. And it tends to change reality. So when patients realize that they have this on their machine, sometimes they do it a little more often. And it's, of course, in some patients, this can be tempered with also. So there's no method that is perfect to measure adhesion or adherence to treatment. Uh, <clears throat> there has been studies to compare to these different methods. This was a questionnaire about uh, there, the questionnaire about what the patient was taking for the patient and to the specialist. So we're saying, okay, uh, this was pretty much close to the reality. This was what the doctor thought the patient was taking, and this was the, what the patient was saying that it was taking. So we, all, we think that uh, for physiotherapy, if it's written down, in this study, patient, uh, patients tended to do 41% of their physio. The specialists thought, the, medi the do medical doctors thought that their patients were doing about 35% of their physio, but patients were writing down that they were doing 62% of their physio. And the same can be said for other treatments. And in most, 
all of, or all of these studies, patients tend to mostly overestimate what they're really thinking or what really doing. This is another way to show this. So we have here what the pa parent self-report uh, is saying. So the parents say, well, the patient is doing 80% of their, of their treatment. This was the, what the child was saying. It's pretty much the same, about 78% of my treatments I'm doing. But if we look at their diary, what the data diary that we were asking them to write down, they're doing 35% of their treatment. And the pharmacy refills were about 50%. So even though these patients were told that we were going to measure their adherence, they, they were saying that they were doing 80% of their treatments, even though they were doing about only about 40 to 50%. Adherence can depend on certain factors, such as the type of medication we're taking. In this study in 2012, which was a very nice study, they, they tried to figure out if, uh, compared to some medication, what was being done. Here in this study, on average, all the medication that was bought was about 50% of what was prescribed. That's very low. That's very low. People only bought 50% of the medication that we were that was being prescribed. That's the last column here. But depending on the medication, there has been some variation. Azithromycin was being bought more than 55% of the time. Dornay's alpha pulmazine more than 60% of the time, even though that's the costliest medication of their of these. Ipritonilic saline only 35%. Inhaled as trionam and antibiotic, 50%. Inhaled colistin, only over 30%. And inhaled tobramycin, 50%. That, that's impressive. So most patients were taking, taking only about, or buying only 50 to 60% of the medication that was being prescribed to them. Depending on their age, it can also change a lot. Patients who were between, in that same study, patients who were between 6 to 10 years of age were being bought about 65% of their treatments. In patients 11 to 17, only 50%. Patients between 18 and 25 years of age, only about 43%. Patients between 26 and 35 years of age, a little over 40%. And when in older patients, a little higher, around 50%. So younger patients tend to do more treatments. Of course, there's the parents, there's the, the, the child, so there's maybe less confrontation, they try to do everything, and then when adolescence sets in, well, adherence tends to lower, even, if you, even in early adulthood, and then tends to increase a little later in adulthood. And um, we tend to maybe think that patients have a higher number of medications may lower their um, adherence, but that's not necessarily true. Patients who had more pulmonary medications in that study tend to have, tended to have a higher adherence to treatment. So maybe they're sicker and they're feeling it, so they tend to think that they need their medication, so they, use, they buy it more. But patients who had a higher number of medications on the right here tended to buy more, their, more of their medication. Also, adherence, of course, is more difficult to determine, but it's more difficult to define also. What's the difference between doing much of their medication or enough of their medication or little or none? And this has been studied in a few studies, but the definition is always very difficult. What's little medication? Is it 20% of your medication, 30% of your medication, enough? can be much variable between patients and between doctors, and much of their medication can be more than 50% maybe for some patients, or maybe 100% for others. In that same study, they tried to figure out why patients weren't taking their medication. For physio, 29% of the patients who weren't taking it said that, well, they didn't have enough time. 20% said, I don't think I need it, so I feel well without treatment. Other, another 20% said, well, I exercise instead. About 15%, I don't believe that it does any good. 
11% it interferes with my social life, 8% simply forget, and 6% went into transplant. So there's a lot of different uh, excuses for not doing the treatment. That is, so that's not very helpful, and that's more difficult for healthcare teams to try to improve adherence if their reasons are so varied. So that shows the importance of individualized approach to these adherence problems. And that's the same for the different respiratory medications or nutritional supplements. There are various uh, definitions of why uh, they're not doing the treatments. So what's the impact of non-adherence? Well, for IV treatments, there was a study showing that patients who were doing more of their, of their, disease, of their uh, treatments tend to have a lower number of courses of uh, IV antibiotics. So maybe that if they were treated better, they had lower, a lower number of courses of IVs. That, of course, is not easy to show. It may be because the patient uh, has a, cor a higher course of IV, so they have a lot of treatments, so they don't want to do all of this, but it's not easy to, to understand. The same for respiratory function. The patients who had a higher number of bot medication ha tended to have a higher FEV1. And the lower you took the lower number, the lower adherence you had, the lower were, was your FEV1. So we did our study in Quebec to make to say, okay, what's being done in our center? And that was very interesting to do. We uh, gathered all the data last year, and we're going to present it this year at the North American CF conference. So the title was Evaluation of Adherence to Treatment in Children Followed in a CF Clinic at the Centre Mère Enfant du Chute Québec. And these are the preliminary results. Uh, the study was mostly done by our pharmacist, Christian Hiroux, but with the help of myself and uh, Dr. Gervais, our pediatrician, uh, one of the pediatricians of our clinic. So we said, well, in our clinic, we say, okay, older patients do have more treatment. Inhaled treatment, treatments can be two to four times a day, representing sometimes more than two hours of care, each, of care each day. At our center, a patient has eight different medications on average. That's what we added. Adherence in various studies varies between 40 to 90 percent, so it's very difficult to determine what's going on in our clinic. And it's possibly linked, as I said earlier, to many factors, such as the type of medication, the age, the family situation, etc. So at our, at our center, well, we don't do usually a systematic evaluation of the adherence of the treatment. Everyone in the clinic is partly involved. The doctor does his job, the nurse, the pharmacist, the, the nutritionist, the physio. We all say, try to figure out if the patient is taking most of his medication or not. And sometimes we have different answers at the end of a clinic. We say, oh, okay, he told me he was taking everything. Oh, no, he told me he was taking half of it. So, so it's not always easy to figure out what they're really taking. Um, so for certain patients, we do a consult to our, our clinic pharmacist, at least for hospitalized patients, they're all seen, or for more problematic patients. Uh, we try to evaluate in these patients what's the bot, med what's the medication that they acquired from their community pharmacy. And we do a non-standardized simile uh, questionnaire that we try to do for these patients. So do we know our pop patient population over with this, or do we know no, not? So is our population more adherent or less adherent than what's been seen in other studies? So the objective of our study was to try to measure the adherence, of course, not the adhesion because it's not a psycho psychology treat, uh, study, but we're trying to measure the adherence of patients in our clinic with the medication list obtained for all their community pharmacies. And we did a questionnaire for the parents and a questionnaire for the adolescents. And we, try, we would try to verify the conversions, the conversions between these three methods. So uh, the same as the previous studies, uh, do patients tend to overestimate what re they're really buying? And we'll try to identify risk factors that might uh, affect adherence or adhesion to the treatment. So it was what's called a transversal descriptive study. So it's a study that we just measured at one time or last year between April and June, we said, okay, we'll, we'll try to take as much patience as possible at one time of the year and say what's been taken over the last, uh, the last year. So it doesn't involve what's been taken for the, uh, their whole life, but at least what 
in the last year in the past. So it was the CF patients from our clinic, and we're trying to take at least one parent from all, ch all the children. And the children aged 12 to 17 had also their own questionnaire. So we tried to use all of these variables. We tried to figure out what was the age of the patient, their age at diagnosis, their family status, their gender, the list of medications, the number of medications, their pharmacy list, their number of hospitalizations, their pulmonary function, their comorbidities, their types of insurance, and for the parents, if it's the mother, the father, uh, how, is the, uh, how is the family structured, what's the degree of parental uh, supervision, and what's the education level of the parent. So that's what we were trying to figure. So we used the questionnaire that was available to do this study. There's one validated questionnaire for adherence. It's called the Treatment Adherence Questionnaire Revised. It's recommended by the American Psychological Association, so it's a good questionnaire that's been validated, so it's been used in other studies. And it's validated for more than 10-year-olds, so it can't be used for younger children. It takes 10 minutes to fill, so it's fairly easy, and it's, adapted for our it's been adapted for our local medication in Canada, and we have a parental version and a child-adolescent version. And we've translated it in French, it's validated, it works well in French too. So we put an introduction to this questionnaire. There's an introduction there saying, well, most adolescents have trouble doing all their treatments each and every day. Please tell us, please, please, please tell us which treatments you've been taking, who you have done in the last week. If you've not taken some treatments, know that you're not the only one. And it's difficult to take all treatments every single day, we know. Please answer honestly to all questions. So we're trying to at least ask them as much as possible, please, please, please tell us the truth. And these are, uh, these are anonymous, so we don't know who filled which, which, question, which questionnaire. The questionnaires were given by a student in pharmacy, which was not involved with the clinic afterwards. She was from France, and she was there for a few months, and then she was going back to France. So no one knew uh, who had filled which questionnaire. So there was no way for us to know uh, who was who. So we, we used 71 patients. We have about 125 patients in, in our CS uh, pediatric patients in our clinic. We had 71 that came in between the, these months, and we had far, 71 pharmacy listings. So it worked very well. We had 70 questionnaires that we've, were filled by parents and 18 by adolescents because, of course, we have uh, children in that uh, age range. And there were some exclusions that patients that weren't included because they didn't take any medication in the study. Uh, there was illiteracy. There was more than one pharmacy. There were some problems. So the patients in this study and the 71 patients that were used, the average age was eight. So patients on average were, were eight years old. 39% uh, were between zero and five years of age, 32% between six and 11, 18% between 12 and 14, and 10% or seven patients between, uh, that were 15, 15 to 18 years of age. Their age of diagnosis was 4.8 months. We, don't, we still don't have a newborn screening in Quebec, so it's not surprising. 52% um, were female. 69% uh, uh, were living with their two parents, so that's impressive because on average it's, about to, it's supposed to be about 50% in Quebec. 17% lived were their, with their mother only, 6% with their fa father only, 6% had shared custody and 3% had others, so I think one of them lived in home care and things like that. Uh, on average, our patients were taking 9.1 different medications, so not 9.1 uh, capsules, 9.1 different medications on average, so that's a lot of medication. 46% uh, were hospitalized at least once in their lifetime. Uh, on average, patients were, uh, were hospitalized seven days in the last year. Of course, this is skewed because on 71 patients, it suffices that one patient be hospitalized 45 days to increase, increase the average a lot. On average, our patients are pretty well. On average, their FIV1 is 97%, so that's very good on 53% that we're able to do a spirometry. 82% uh, had private in drug insurance and 18% were the, with the public REMQ drug insurance plan. 
So the characteristics of the of the parents, well, uh, the patients, the parents who filled the questionnaires were mostly the mothers, uh, and they said that they always supervise the treatments on 66% of these patients, generally on 27%, sometimes only 4%, and never only 3%. So parents were t- saying that they did supervise their pay their children uh, for their treatments. And the parents were mostly uh, mostly a good education level. Uh, 25% at secondary school or less. 27 were collegiate level, and 47% had gone to university. So, when we looked at what the patients and the parents bought at the pharmacy, what did they buy at the pharmacy from what we were prescribing? For hypertonial saline on all the on all the patients on total every age from zero to eighteen, the hypertonic saline seventy five percent of this hypertonic saline was bought at the pharmacy. That's still pretty good compared from what I've shown you before on fifty percent average. For pulmonary patients were buying seventy eight percent, Toby nebulization eighty two percent, and in powder ninety three percent, colistin. Estrianam, pancreatic enzymes were bought. 91% of the, of the prescribed enzymes were bought. Were they all taken? I don't know, but at least 91% were bought. Vitamins, 76%. Azithromycin and antacids were still bought a lot. So on average, 82% of the medication that was prescribed was bought at the pharmacy. Of course, we have a good... Um, uh, medication insurance in Quebec, all the patients have insurance, but that's very good. But what about the questionnaires? When we said that the patients, the parents, okay, uh, we are going to call your pharmacy to figure out what you bought, but still write to us what you think your, pa- your child was taking. And the average was 95%. They're taking 95% of the medication, even though they were buying only 82%. And I'll show you a little later that the, what the, the adolescents were thinking was pretty much the same. They said that they were taking 92% of the medication, even though they were buying only 82. But it's still a, a small difference. So if you compare what the parents were saying to what was really bought at the pharmacy, there was still a significant difference, more than 10% difference between what the parents were thinking their pa- child was taking and what they were really buying. And that was true for pretty much all the medication. But still, we had a high adherence compared to other studies. So we tried to figure out, well, is there a difference? Is there a type of parent that is thinking that they're taking more medication? Is there a difference? But it wasn't influenced by the age of the patient. Uh, So younger children were not uh, expected to take more medication or older ones. Uh, the gender of the patient didn't change anything, the family status, the participating pa- patient, parent, and everything else. There wasn't any other influences on the differences in patients, uh, in parents who were thinking that their child was taking more medication that they were really buying. But there are two factors that, the, that made the variation on what was really bought, being bought at the pharmacy. Patients who were less than five years of age, 87% of the medication was bought. For patients over 15 years of age, only 63% was being bought. That's that's a bit disappointing. And if you compared less than 12-year-olds compared with more than 12-year-olds, there was still a significant difference. So we're expecting that patients who are coming into secondary school with well, the adherence to treatment is getting much lower after that, and especially after 15 years of age. And that's, where the, that's the time where they're, they need their medication the most uh, often time because they're getting a little sicker, uh, they're, they're needing some treatments, they're not getting enough sleep, so maybe they should do a lot more of their treatments. So that's the problem here. And the family status did change the, what was being bought at the pharmacy. The patients who were uh, staying with their two parents, 85% of the medication was being bought, and patients who are staying with only one of their patients, uh, parents or, or other situations, uh, 74% uh, of the medication was bought. And this was, uh, we, we checked that uh, 
parents were not going to two pharmacies and things like that. So it's not an, another factor that's being influenced here. So the act of buying a medication was mostly influenced with these, family status and age, but not all the other factors. What about adolescents? We still have a few minutes. Well, adolescents, well, on average, they were 14 years of age. We had 20 adolescents in that study. Uh, 13 was, were between 12 and 14 years of age, and seven only were more than 15 years of age. 65% uh, were a girl. They took a lot of medication, 10.9 medication on average, and their FEV1 was still very good. Our patients with over 12 years of age were still, still at a 91% FEV1 on average. How did they answer this questionnaire, the, the adolescents? Well, they were saying that they were taking 92% of the medication. That was in 12 years or older. If you remember correctly here, patients who were more than 12 years of, of age were taking 70, were buying 75% of their medication. So they were buying 75%, but they're really saying that they're taking 92%. So even though we were saying that we would call their pharmacy, they still thought that they took more medication than they really did buy. So if we compare the three different ways to measure adherence in adolescents, we have what the adolescent thinks he's taking, what the parent still thinks he's taking, but what the pharmacy says that they're buying is still 15% or, or almost 20% lower. So there's still an overestimation of what patients think they're really taking. And what we have to take into account is that there are extreme cases of non-adherence when we're looking at individual patients. Here we have the 18 patients who are more than 12 years of age, and all the non-squared patients, 2, 3, 4, 7, 10, 11, 12, are doing very well on their adherence. But some patients are taking 50, 50, less than 20 per, 12, less than 20 percent of their pay, pay, uh, treatments, 30 percent of the treatments. So there are extremes that are maybe lowering the averages on uh, also. But because this study was, um, uh, was we didn't know which, which patients these are, these three, four, five, eight patients that are taking less medication, we don't know who they are. So we can't really say, okay, do they have more risk factors than the others? So if we compare our rates of adherence to other similar studies, are we doing better? Well, yes, and that on average, we're doing better. Patients are, our patients in Quebec are taking more medication than what we see in other, in other studies. And that's true for most medications. Uh, for gastrointestinal treatments, well, our patients are taking 90, are buying 97% of their treatments uh, compared to 88% in another study. And for respiratory treatments, uh, they're buying 87% compared to 62% in the study, in other studies. So what to do with such results? Should we be encouraged that our rates of adherence are better than average? Or should we be discouraged that rates of adherence are desperately low, especially in some adolescents? And why? And does adherence mean adhesion in our population? Are we, are we really convincing our patients to take their, their medication for their own good? or are they just following our orders because they like us? And how can we target the patients with poor adhesion? Are they only adolescents? Should we target separate parents? Or are there other factors that, are, that we can't say here? And how can we develop positive ways to improve adhesion? That's still a mystery. There has not been a lot of studies. There has been some studies in the last few years trying to figure out very involving ways to try to improve adherence, uh, telephone calls, there's uh, some apps, some iPhone apps that might improve adherence. There have been some studies at least on the short term might improve adherence. But what we want is to improve adhesion on the long term. And that involves knowing your disease and improving on what you know and what you care about yourself. So in conclusion, adhesion to a therapeutic plan is a difficult and complex process, especially in a chronic disease involving multiple time-consuming treatments, such as CF. A high number of individuals, family, healthcare, and community factors can influence adhesion or not to a therapeutic plan. It might be difficult, it might be possible, 
<laughs> to identify patients and families at risk of an non-adhesion if we take enough time, but it's not easy. However, the best methods to improve adhesion are still not known and may include numerous techniques that need to be especially individualized as much as possible because the reasons for not being adherent or ad adhesive to your treatment sent, uh, seem to be very different from patient to patient. So thank you very much. I'll leave you with that beautiful image of Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, and I'll be taking any questions. And uh, our uh, patient on the on the line might want to answer some questions uh, himself also. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for a very informative presentation. We now have time to ask both Patrick and Matthew questions. And again, you can either use the raise your hand feature to ask your questions, and I can unmute you, or you can type your questions in the Q and A box. And perhaps I'll start off with a question to Matthew, and I've just unmuted you, Matthew. I'm just curious uh, what challenges you have faced, if any, with treatment adherence. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, so your question was if I have faced any challenges, you said? Correct. Um, I have, I mean, it was, for me personally, it was more at an early age, but um, it, they weren't such challenges that really affected my health as it was more just my mental want to do the treatments. Like you said, there was more of like, they were more compliant, so it was more I had to do them, this is stupid, I don't want to do them, but I'm still going to do them because I don't want to get sick. But over time, I sort of came to the realization through my health team, my parents, that it was really something I had to do, not just because, and I, I learned that I wanted to do them almost, because for me, I, I play a lot of sports, I do a lot of things with my friends, and if I didn't do my treatments, I wouldn't be able to do those things. I wouldn't be able to have a good quality of daily life, like uh, Dr. Patrick was saying. So I, f I just feel like in me doing my treatments, it helps me in other areas of my life, which is a good reminder for me to do my treatments. Great, thanks. And just as a follow-up, are there any phone or computer apps that you have used um, to help with treatment adherence? Uh, personally, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't really looked into that sort of uh, that sort of gateway. But it's definitely something I'd be interested in. I mean, if they help, it's always it's always something to look at. Great, thank you. Thank you. No problem. And then actually perhaps as a follow-up to that for you, Patrick, um, what do you envision for the future in terms of adherence? I know you touched a little bit on apps as well, but do you imagine that um, technology is going to play a greater role in patients' health and adherence? Well, I think that uh, technology can help in adherence per se, at least on the short term, for difficult, for difficult um, moments in life. So for a short while, over a few months, to try to improve adherence, give it a boost for a while, it can be helpful. I'm not sure it's the, the, um, the right way to do it on the long term and to improve adhesion, but if, it, if the app is or the, uh, or the way to do it uh, improves knowledge of the disease or knowledge of the medication, I think that can improve adhesion on the long term. So I think the things that need to be well done to improve knowledge to the patient and improve their own involvement in their own disease. Great, thanks. We have a question from John Wallenberg. I'll unmute you now. Ah, okay, yeah, this is for Matthew. Matthew, you seem to, to indicate, uh, uh, if I understood you correctly anyway, that when you see an improvement in your own performance, you're more motivated to, to adhere to, to the treatment. I'm wondering if you do anything. There are different tools like Fitbit and, and different little tools now that track health and performance and how you're doing. Have you ever looked into tracking your health um, with some kind of an app or some kind of a device? And, and do you think that might motivate you if you saw a difference in before or after treatment? Um, personally, 
I haven't looked into those sort of things. I mean, for me, I, I like I said, I do a lot of sports. I play baseball. I um, I play golf. I do a lot of those physical activities. And for me, it's my performance in those in those six specific areas. Uh, so, in terms of if I had one of those apps, it, it definitely could motivate me more because for me, when I look at my say performance in a baseball game and how I did. If I can attribute that to the fact that, oh, if I do my, say, my treatments more and I'm more healthy, I can perform better, then it definitely gives me a motivation to want to do those treatments because it betters me in the things that I love. So in terms of an app like, say, Fitbit, like you mentioned, uh, if if it, do, if it did give me on a daily, day-to-day basis more performance, it, it definitely would. I can see it motivating myself because, like I said, I'm a very uh, – I'm a physical person, and that would definitely motivate me. But that might not necessarily be for everyone because not all patients might be interested in uh, sports or fitness. So it's it definitely would help, but I think it's more towards the person. So me, yes. Uh, other patients, I'm not sure. Thank you. We also have a question from Ian McIntosh. Thanks, Joanna. Patrick, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm loving this uh, picture of the, the chateau there. Um, Matthew, I wanted to ask, uh, you're obviously very um, involved in your own treatments and so on. I'm just curious if over, over the years, if your clinic team has done anything or has been instrumental in any way in helping you to adhere to your treatments or to getting you motivated or to helping you to your mindset that you're at now where you're very involved in, in wanting to do it. Has your clinic team done anything that has sort of helped to promote that? I mean, my clinic team is, they're almost like my best friends. I have a very good relationship with them. I can contact them whenever I need to. Uh, Karen, and Ned, all my physiotherapists, my main they're, nurses, they're I, I have a I have a very good uh, relationship with them, and thus they have motivated me. I mean, when you see someone from growing up from, I've had generally, I mean, there's been a couple changes, but I've had generally the same CF team from when I was a small child at a year old to where I am now. I'm at the age of 18, so next my next treatment I will actually be transferring over to the adult clinic. So I've basically grown up with all these people. So I, I, I have a very good relationship, and, and they did motivate me. They would, because they didn't want to see me fail or see me in the hospital. I, me personally, I've been admitted twice for a two-week duration each time. And, I mean, that hurt them just as if it looked on my mom's face that I was in the hospital. Like, So they definitely did motivate me. You know, they explained the different treatments I would have to do. Uh, when to take my enzymes, how many. They're, they were very involved in that to a, a very personal level of they'd ask me, you know, okay, well, you play baseball or you, you're out with your friends, you know, you, you, we want to make it so you don't lose your day-to-day activities, but we want to make it so that you still do your treatments. And they, and I mean, I don't, I can't really put it into words, really. I mean, without them, I don't think I'd be as healthy and as involved, like you say, as I was now, because they really, they really showed me a path that that brought me to where I am today. Thank you. There don't appear to be any more questions, so we're going to close the webinar here. We'd like to send a big thank you to you all for joining and to both. Dr. Daniel and Matthew for their helpful and informative discussions. The sixth and final webinar in our education series will take place September 29th at 2 p.m. on cystic fibrosis-related diabetes, and you can register on our website at cysticfibrosis.ca. Thank you again, and have a wonderful afternoon.